In 2003, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor wrote that it had been 25 years since the Supreme Court first approved the use of race in college admissions, and that in another 25 years, she expected it would no longer be necessary. The court had an opportunity to revisit that ruling at the halfway point in 2013 and 2016. And yet another case just came a knocking on the justice's door. Affirmative action has vexed the high court for nearly half a century. But how did we get to the point where publicly funded colleges may judge applicants in part based on the color of their skin? And how is this even constitutional given the Constitution's guarantee of equal protection? I'm Anastasia Bowden. And I'm Elizabeth Slattery. This week on DIST, we're looking at Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin, the sequel. The court's decision is indefensible. I respectfully dissent. Because the majority in this case has not done what a court of law must do, I respectfully dissent. For these reasons and others elaborated, in my opinion, I respectfully dissent. We respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I dissent. The 14th Amendment proclaims that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Passed in the wake of the Civil War by the Reconstruction Congress, this provision was meant to stop states from discriminating against black Americans. But it was written broadly enough to protect Americans of all races from unjust discrimination. As you know, listeners, the road to equality for black Americans would be long and hard fought. Even in dark days, though, there was hope of a time when the promise of equality embodied in the Declaration of Independence and the 14th Amendment would be realized. There was hope in the immortal words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Just as I have a dream my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. So how did we go from Dr. King's dream to allowing colleges to judge applicants based on the color of their skin? The idea of affirmative action initially came from an executive order issued by President John F. Kennedy in 1961. It would eventually make its way into higher ed, but started out in the employment context. Here's civil rights expert Roger Clegg. Well, I think that, um, you know, the phrase affirmative action is interesting. You know, it was first used in the civil rights context in 1961 in an executive order that President Kennedy signed. And at that time, you know, what it meant was taking positive steps, you know, just what it sounds like, affirmative measures, uh, proactive measures to make sure that you weren't discriminating. And, you know, that made sense at that time. Remember, this was, you know, 1961. It was before uh, it was illegal for everyone to discriminate you know, in, in, in private employment, uh, in, in hiring, particular African-Americans. And so there were a lot of companies that had announced policies of just simply not hiring black people. And so the government decided that, well, um, you know, for our contractors, uh, that's not going to be allowed. And so if you were going to do contracting with the federal government, you had to take, you know, affirmative action. You had to have an affirmative action program. And what what that meant was you had to make sure that you actually weren't discriminating. You know, these companies for years might have had policies where they did affirmatively, you know, discriminate against African Americans. And you had to make sure that the the new non-discriminatory policy was publicized and, and enforced. And how did this translate into higher ed? If you had schools that for a long time had, had been segregated, you know, had, were, were part of a Jim Crow system, then you know, affirmative action you know, would, uh, you know, at a minimum, require you know, telling your admissions people that, well, we're not doing that anymore, uh, and making sure that they understood that, that this wasn't something that was just being done with a wink and a nod, that uh, they actually had to enforce that. And then when people did not uh, follow the new law, they that they had to be fired or, or disciplined or, or something like that. Another early kind of affirmative action, you know, which you alluded to, Elizabeth, is you know, casting a wide net, you know, m- making sure that people uh, knew that they would be welcome at a school. And again, that makes perfect sense you know, in the historical context. You know, if, if for years you weren't interested in, 
in, in having African Americans apply to your school, you wouldn't have bothered to recruit, you know, in neighborhoods or at high schools or, you know, whatever that um, that had lots of blacks in them because you weren't interested in them. So taking positive steps to to make sure that that, that was no longer the case, you know, sending your recruiters into the inner city, you know, as well as into lily wide suburbs, you know, would would make you know perfect sense. Uh, you know, telling people that they would be welcome. This is very different from how affirmative action works today. Here's more from Roger. The problem was, though, um, you know, when schools started to say that, well, uh, you know, we're not happy enough with with the numbers that we're getting, Mm -hmm. and we want to start considering race uh, uh, in a way that is going to give preferential treatment to groups that have been discriminated against in the past. And... Of course, the, the sort of justification for this, you know, in the education area and in other areas as well, um, you know, was that, well, you know, you, uh, in order to level the playing field, you know, we, we sort of have to do this. I mean, and I think that that was the, uh, the rationale that was, that was commonly used, you know, at a lot of places. Let's back it up a second. Before we get to any Supreme Court cases, it's important to note that as part of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964, Congress prohibited discrimination based on race, color, or national origin in programs that receive federal financial assistance. And that includes the vast majority of colleges. At this point, some schools had already started using racial preferences, a more apt description than affirmative action, to boost the number of black student admissions. But how does that square with the Constitution? That brings us to the first pair of college admissions cases to reach the Supreme Court. First came DeFunis versus Odegaard in 1974. Marco DeFunis, a white man who was denied admission to the University of Washington Law School, argued the school's affirmative action policies, which resulted in the admission of minority applicants with lower test scores, violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. The lower court ordered the school to admit DeFunis, but by the time his case reached the Supreme Court, He was in his final semester of law school, so the justices ruled that the case was moot. Four members of the court wanted to reach the merits of the issue. Justice William O. Douglas, a.k.a. Wild Bill Douglas, dissented, saying the law school entrance exam was designed to discriminate against Jews. And liberal lion Justice William Brennan dissented, arguing that the school's voluntary cessation of alleged illegal activity doesn't moot a case. Four years later, the court would have a mulligan. This time, in Regents of the University of California versus Bakke, the court reviewed the admissions program used by the UC Davis Medical School. The school had a two-track system with 84 out of 100 seats filled based on merit and 16 set aside for disadvantaged minorities. Alan Bakke, a white man, was denied admission twice and sued, arguing that this violated Title VI of the Civil Rights Act as well as the U.S. Constitution. Here's a fun fact. Marco DeFunis, from the earlier case, wrote an amicus brief supporting Alan Bakke. Okay, so what did the court actually decide? Well, it was a doozy of a ruling. Here's Justice Lewis Powell, who wrote the controlling opinion. So much for an introduction. As there are six separate opinions, I will state first the court's judgment. Insofar as the California Supreme Court held that Bakke must be admitted to the Davis Medical School, we affirm. Insofar as the California court prohibited Davis from considering race as a factor in admissions, we reverse. Wait, what? Powell explained that schools could use racial preferences, but only to promote, quote, the educational benefits that flow from an ethnically diverse student body. He rejected other justifications the school offered, such as remedying past societal discrimination, explaining that would not support imposing disadvantages upon persons like Alan Bakke, who bear no responsibility for whatever harm the beneficiaries of the special admissions program are thought to have suffered. Powell explained that, quote, a state has a substantial interest that legitimately may be served by a properly devised admissions program involving the competitive consideration of race and ethnic origin. He continued, It is not an interest in simple ethnic diversity in which a specified percentage of the student body is in effect guaranteed to be members of selected ethnic groups that can justify the use of race. 
but a far broader array of qualifications and characteristics of which racial or ethnic origin is but a single, though important, element. Four members agreed with Powell that Baki had been discriminated against, but they would have resolved the case based on Title VI and not reached the constitutional issue. And Justice Brennan, joined by three others, would have allowed the school to continue using racial preferences in order to remedy past societal discrimination. Here's Brennan. We cannot, and as our opinion attempts to demonstrate, need not, under our Constitution, let colorblindness become myopia, which masks the reality that many created equal have been treated within our lifetimes as inferior, both by the law and by their fellow citizens. And Justice Harry Blackman noted, I yield to no one in my earnest hope that the time will come when an affirmative action program is unnecessary and is in truth only a relic of the past. I would hope that we could reach this stage within a decade at the most. At some time, the United States must and will reach a stage of maturity where action along this line is no longer necessary. Then persons will be regarded as persons, and discrimination of the type we address today will be an ugly feature of history that is instructive, but that is behind us. Since the court didn't actually issue a majority opinion, just a one-justice controlling opinion, it opened a can of worms about the constitutionality of affirmative action without actually deciding the issue. Here's Roger Clegg. The court could have avoided trying to figure out and trying to come up with a, uh, you know, a good rule for when the use of race should be uh, you know, constitutional in college admissions simply by following Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And that's what four of the justices in Bakke would have done. So the logical thing for the court to have done would, would, would have been for it to say that, well, you know, look, um, whether these things can be done constitutionally or not is, is an interesting question, but we don't have to reach it. Uh, Congress has made the decision that if you get federal money, you can't do this. And that's that. But that's not what happened. It's understandable that the court does not want to have a rule that says that the government can never consider race under any circumstances in anything that it does. You know, you can sit down and you can come up with hypotheticals about why there ought to be exceptions sometimes for that. An obvious one that was uh, used by some justices of the court you know, early on uh, was in the aftermath of a prison race riot. Okay, Let's suppose that you know, prison has had a race riot. The black prisoners and the white prisoners have been killing each other. And in the course of stopping this, this race riot, uh, the prison decides that, well, we're going to have to separate the white prisoners from the black prisoners. And we're going to have to, that separation is going to have to last for a little while while we figure out, you know, what to do to, you know, improve prison security. Well, in that circumstance, the government is classifying people according to skin color and treating people differently, you know, sending them into different cell blocks or whatever because of that. But nobody would say that, well, that should be, you know, unconstitutional, or at least it seemed it's it would be very odd for a court to say, no, 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 you know, you, you can't do that. You have to let these people, you know, continue to kill one another. So what this, and you can come up with, you know, with other you know, hypotheticals, you know, as, as well like that. So, you know, what the court has done is come up with this sort of general approach that says that, well, you know, you can't, you know, racial classifications are highly disfavored. You know, you can't uh, uh, use them in any but very limited circumstances. Any racial classification has to survive what's known as strict scrutiny review. And what is strict scrutiny, you ask? It is the highest standard courts use to review government action, such as when the government sorts people by their race. The government has to show that its use of race is narrowly tailored to further a compelling government interest. In other words, as Roger put it, If you're going to use racial classifications, you have to have a really, really good reason, compelling interest, and you have to be using them for no more, for no longer, for uh, you know, no, no more broadly than is absolutely necessary in order to achieve that compelling interest. And in a case involving government contracting, Adirond versus Pena in 1995, the court held that all racial classifications are subject to strict scrutiny review. 
John Yu, a professor at the University of California Berkeley Law School, had some thoughts on this as well. It's unbelievable to me that the Supreme Court thinks that race cannot be used by the government, except in two situations. One, national security. And they've basically said not even then now. They, you know, they've overruled the Korematsu case, which upheld the Japanese internments in World War II. For the record, Chief Justice Roberts explained that Korematsu had been overruled in the court of history. But back to John. And then the second one is diversity in high, only in higher education. So the only time where the government is under such crisis and challenge that they have to resort to race and it's allowed by the Supreme Court is diversity in higher education, not law enforcement, not national security, not economic recession, not uh, you know chaos, <laughs> you know, not you know not natural disasters, not in prisons, only higher education. That is that just doesn't make any sense. It's such an obvious anomaly. I think that arose because of the cultural pressures on Justice Kennedy and before him Justice O'Connor to be the fifth vote to uphold affirmative action. John's getting a little ahead of us, but Justices Kennedy and O'Connor will play important roles in the coming cases. Here's more from John. That given our country's history with the use of race, with the government's use of race, and the maintenance of slavery and then segregation, we should have learned our lesson. The Constitution prohibits the government from ever using race, because even when we think it's benign, it most likely is not. So the better thing for our society is expressed in the 14th Amendment is just never to use it at all. As time marched on, did schools curb their use of race and move towards regarding persons as persons, as Justice Blackmun put it? The court would consider race in college admissions again in a pair of cases in 2003, challenging the University of Michigan's undergraduate and law school admissions. Here's how it worked at the university. Admission was based on a point system. An applicant needed 100 points to gain admission, and points were awarded based on high school GPA, SAT or ACT scores, strength of their high school curriculum, and leadership skills, among other factors. There was also a miscellaneous category, which included points for socioeconomic disadvantage and being a member of an underrepresented minority group. Here's a breakdown of some of the points. You could get 12 points for a perfect SAT or ACT score, up to five points for leadership and service, one point for writing an outstanding personal essay. Membership in an underrepresented minority group meant an automatic 20 points. That's hardly a plus factor that might nudge someone who was otherwise close to gaining admission. And over at the law school, admission was a bit murkier. Applicants were screened based on a flexible assessment of their academic ability, talents, experiences, and potential to contribute to the learning of those around them. Its stated goal was to enroll a, quote, critical mass of underrepresented minority students. Analysis of the law school's admissions data, however, showed that it accepted certain minority group applicants in proportion to their statistical representation in the applicant pool, which is patently unconstitutional racial balancing. Two white Michigan residents, Jennifer Gratz and Barbara Gruder, sued after they were denied admission to the university and law school respectively, and their cases went all the way to the Supreme Court. The court announced the rulings in both cases on June 23, 2003. In Gratz's case, the court held that the undergrad admissions plan failed to provide individualized review of applicants. Its heavy reliance on an applicant's race could not be squared with strict scrutiny review. Here's Chief Justice William Rehnquist. We hold that the university's current policy, which distributes 20 points to every underrepresented minority applicant solely because of race, is not narrowly tailored to achieve respondents' asserted interest in diversity. In the Bakke case, Justice Powell emphasized the importance of considering each particular applicant as an individual, assessing all of the qualities that individual possess, possesses, and in turn evaluating that individual's ability to contribute to the unique setting of higher education. Respondents readily conceive that this automatic distribution makes race decisive for virtually every minimally qualified underrepresented minority applicant. And in Gruder's case, the court ruled in favor of the law school, deferring to the school officials' educational judgment that a diverse student body is essential to its educational mission. It found that the school's critical mass goal was not an impermissible race-based quota. Even while ruling for the law school, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor closed out her opinion with this. Now, we are mindful that a core purpose of the 14th Amendment 
was to do away with all governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. Accordingly, race-conscious admissions policies must be limited in time. Enshrining a permanent justification for racial preferences would offend this fundamental equal protection principle. We we see no reason to exempt race-conscious admissions programs from the requirement that all governmental uses of race must have a logical endpoint. We take the law school at its word that it would like nothing better than to find a race-neutral admissions formula and will terminate its race-conscious admissions program as soon as practicable. It has been 25 years since Justice Powell first suggested approval of the use of race to further an interest in student body diversity in the context of higher education. We expect that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interests that we approve today. Between the two cases, there were 12 concurring and dissenting opinions. Justice Antonin Scalia wrote a partial concurrence and partial dissent in Grutter, foreshadowing what would come later. He wrote, Litigation can be expected on behalf of minority groups intentionally shortchanged in the institution's composition of its generic minority critical mass. I do not look forward to any of these cases. The Constitution proscribes government discrimination on the basis of race, and state-provided education is no exception. Together, the Grutter and Gratz decisions underscore that the court was not issuing a blanket endorsement of race-based admissions. Any consideration of race must be carefully and narrowly crafted and executed. Gratz made clear that race may only be considered on the margin and not as the decisive factor in admissions. But in the real world, schools saw this as a green light, ignoring O'Connor's warning of an expiration date for the use of race in higher ed admissions. The justices wouldn't have to wait long for the next major challenge to arrive, but first, some background. Before SCOTUS decided Grutter and Gratz, throughout the 1980s and 90s, lower courts were left to figure out how to apply the court's fractured ruling in Bakke. One appeals court invalidated Texas's admissions program for its use of race, which led to the passage of the Top 10% law. This granted automatic admission to students at Texas public high schools who graduated in the top 10% of their class. And the Top 10% law worked better than racial preferences. Larry Faulkner, president of the University of Texas, wrote in 2000 that not only was minority student enrollment up, They were earning higher GPAs and had better retention rates compared with students admitted before the top 10% law went into effect. But after the Supreme Court released its Grutter decision, the very same day, Faulkner announced the school would reintroduce race-based admissions for spots not filled by top 10% students. The school began using a holistic review that allowed administrators to consider race as a plus factor for certain preferred minorities. Roger Clegg explained how some people justified the change. There were a lot of sort of, you know, loose talk, not necessarily by the lawyers, but by, you know, other people in Texas who said, well, you know, we we want the University of Texas to look like Texas. Or, you know, know, the, the sort of idea is that if you have a lot of a particular racial or ethnic group in the state, then that should be reflected in the racial and ethnic makeup of your flagship university. And that sort of sounds good. It certainly makes for good political speeches and, and may be politically something that you know, has a lot of, of salience. It has nothing to do with education and educational benefits and, and critical mass. It certainly doesn't sound like it would. And again, you know, why should, I mean, if your school is supposed to sort of you know, look like the demographic, supposed to reflect the demographic makeup of your state, you know, why isn't that a two-edged sword? Why doesn't that mean that if you don't have very many Asian Americans, for example, in your state, then you shouldn't have very many of them in your school because then your school isn't going to look like your, your, your state. Uh, it's very, as I say, it bends back on itself in, in a very ugly way. Abigail Fisher, a white Texas resident, did not graduate in the top 10% of her high school class. So she was competing for admission with applicants who received racial preferences. After she was denied admission, she sued the university for discriminating against her based on her race. Her case went to the Supreme Court, and in June 2013, Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote the opinion for the seven-member majority, with one dissent. 
7 plus 1 only adds up to 8. So you might be wondering, what happened to the ninth justice? Well, Justice Elena Kagan, still relatively new to the court, recused herself from Fisher because she had been involved in the case as Solicitor General of the United States while it was pending in the lower court. The court sent the case back to the lower court, finding the university needed to show its use of racial preferences was actually narrowly tailored. Kennedy explained that courts may defer somewhat to schools' academic judgment about whether to pursue the educational benefits that flow from student body diversity, but here's what else Kennedy had to say. Once the university has established that its goal of diversity is consistent with strict scrutiny, there still must be a further judicial determination that the means chosen by the university to attain diversity are narrowly tailored to that goal. And on this point, the university receives no deference. As the court said in Grutter, it remains at all times the university's obligation to demonstrate and the judiciary's obligation to determine that the admissions processes ensure that each applicant is evaluated as an individual and not in a way that makes an applicant's race, race or ethnicity the defining feature of his or her application. Narrow tailoring also requires that the reviewing court verify that it's necessary for a university to use race to achieve the educational benefits of diversity. And this involves a careful judicial inquiry into whether a university could achieve sufficient diversity without using racial classifications. Strict scrutiny must not be strict in theory, but fatal in fact, but the opposite is also true. Strict scrutiny must not be strict in theory, but feeble in fact. In order for judicial review to be meaningful, a university must make a showing that its plan is narrowly tailored to achieve the only interest that this court has approved in this context the benefits of a student body diversity that encompasses a broad array of qualifications and characteristics of which racial or ethnic origin is but a single, though important, element. Justice Clarence Thomas concurred, saying he doesn't think there's a compelling state interest to justify what this is, government-sanctioned discrimination based on race. He explained that, quote, only a social emergency rising to the level of imminent danger to life and limb would be a compelling enough interest to justify racial discrimination. He wrote that even though it may be cloaked in good intentions, the university's racial tinkering harms the very people it claims to be helping. And here's what the solo dissenter, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, had to say. I have several times explained why government actors, including state universities, need not blind themselves to the still lingering, everyday evident effects of centuries of law-sanctioned inequality. Among constitutionally permissible options, I remain convinced, those that candidly dis disclose what they are doing, candidly disclose their consideration of race as a relevant factor, are preferable to plans that conceal or obscure what drives them. So Abigail Fisher returned to the lower court, but it wasn't long before she was back at the Supreme Court Fisher versus the University of Texas, the sequel. More affirmative, more action. And this time, people expected the university to lose. The justices heard oral argument in Fisher 2 in December 2015. And then... We do have some breaking news into CNN to bring you some very sad breaking news on the death of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. This is a Fox News alert. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia has died at age 79. We join you with this breaking news. Justice Antonin Scalia, the Supreme Court's most influential conservative, has died. The first Italian-American to serve on the court. Scalia was appointed by President Ray and joining the court in... On February 13th, 2016, we lost a titan of the law the great dissenter of the modern era. The court would go on to issue its ruling in Fisher's case that June. Justice Kennedy has our opinion this morning in case 14981, Fisher versus the University of Texas. The court ruled 4-3 to uphold the university's race-conscious admissions program. Fisher versus University of Texas. This time, Anthony Kennedy means business. Except he really doesn't, and is going to defer to the university officials. Fisher versus University of Texas. Taking the firm out of affirmative action. Here's Justice Kennedy. Fisher 1 explained that under the Equal Protection Clause, race may not be considered by a university unless the admissions process can withstand strict scrutiny. 
Strict scrutiny requires the university to demonstrate with clarity that its purpose or interest is both constitutionally permissible and substantial, and that its use of a racial classification is necessary to the accomplishment of its purpose. And this imposes on the university the ultimate burden of demonstrating that race-neutral alternatives that are both available and workable do not suffice to fulfill its interest in student body diversity. This court now holds that the Court of of Appeals was correct to conclude that the university has met its burden. Given the state of the record and the data available to the university in 2008, when petitioner's application was rejected, she was not denied equal treatment. The compelling interest that justifies consideration of race in college admissions, however, is not an interest in enrolling a certain number of minority students. Rather, it is an interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from student body diversity. The record here reveals that the university articulated concrete and precise goals with respect to its admissions decisions. Justice Samuel Alito dissented, and you can tell he's frustrated with the majority. Here's Alito. It's important to make clear what is and what is not at stake in this case. What is involved is whether a state school may discriminate on the basis of race without being subject to meaningful judicial scrutiny. What is not at stake is whether the University of Texas or any other state school may adopt an admissions plan that results in a student body with a broad representation of students from all racial and ethnic groups. The University of Texas was admitting a very diverse body of applicants before it started its present race-based plan. Tomorrow marks the three-year anniversary of Fisher One, our prior decision in this case. And in light of today's decision, it is really hard to see the point of Fisher One. Fisher One reiterated that a state university may not take race into account in making admissions decisions unless the university shows that doing so is necessary to serve a compelling interest and that the plan is narrowly tailored to achieve that end. We never defer to government officials when they say, trust us, it's necessary for us to discriminate on the basis of race. And state universities are not angels whose actions are above judicial scrutiny. Instead, race-based plans must be carefully reviewed by the courts. The court effectively defers to the judgment of the University of Texas that its plan is necessary to achieve a vaguely defined objective, the educational benefits of diversity. There is no way that this court or any other court can tell today or will be able to tell at any point in the future whether the university's plan is actually serving that objective. But the university says not to worry. It will announce when and if the goal has been reached. And the court effectively accepts that assurance. Such deference is inconsistent with Fisher I and with the very idea of strict scrutiny. In Fisher I, we explained quite clearly what the university needed to do to justify its new race-conscious plan. The first step was to define its interest in using racial classifications with clarity. Without that, meaningful judicial review is not possible. But the university has never complied. It has never come close. It has offered a shifting series of vague objections. When it adopted its challenge policy, it said that its goal was to obtain a critical mass of underrepresented minorities. What does that term mean? The university has never said. Is it some absolute number of African American and Hispanic students? The university says no. Is it the percentage of African Americans and Hispanics in the population of the state? Again, the university says no. The university has submitted more than 100 pages of briefing to this court in the two Fisher cases. We twice heard argument on its behalf by very experienced counsel. We repeatedly asked counsel to explain what the term critical mass means, and we never got a clear answer. We still have no clear idea what the university means by a critical mass. In its most recent brief, the university says that it needs to take race into account in order to admit, quote, the black student with high grades from Andover. This is a very strange argument for affirmative action. Affirmative action was created to help disadvantaged students, but the university now says it needs to take race into account in order to give preference 
to students from very privileged backgrounds. And it must be kept in mind that when an applicant from a privileged background is favored, students from less privileged backgrounds are likely to suffer. Admitting an Andover graduate because of his or her race may mean denying admission to the child of poor Asian immigrants who speak little English, or a white applicant from an impoverished rural family, none of whose members has ever attended college. This is affirmative action gone berserk. I hope this is a one-off attributable to unique circumstances, but if it is interpreted by university administrators to mean that race-based admissions plans will no longer be strictly scrutinized, it will mark a very sad turn in our cases. I therefore respectfully dissent. John Yu made a similar point about who actually benefits from these policies. He's a professor at Berkeley Law School, and he explained what happened after California passed Proposition 209 in 1996, banning state schools from giving preferential treatment based on race. This is the interesting thing when we at the at Berkeley studied what to do after Prop 209. And there were colleagues of mine who just blatantly wanted, were saying things like, we've still got to be able to use race. We just have to figure out another way to do it. And so we did a study, and it turned out, if I remember correctly, that under affirmative action, the prototypical student who benefited the most was a black student who would graduate from Princeton with a B minus average. So these are not people who already were socioeconomically in hard streets. It was sort of like the black and Hispanic middle and upper classes that were benefiting the most from affirmative action. So if you switch to socioeconomic class as being a factor, it will still, I assume, uh, result in significant minority populations. But one will be out of the, you know, the skin color game, which I think would just be beneficial for everyone. But the second thing is, who knows what's going to happen? It might actually lead to something that's better than what we have today, that you don't see this kind of uh, gaming of the system based on race. But one last thing I was going to say, I think Ultimately, this is going to fail. And you see it in California now. There is no dominant race. You know, there's no majority race in California. There's a lot of people who are mixed race. I, this is why I think the Constitution and the Supreme Court were wise to say we shouldn't use race. It does smack of the kind of uh, race measuring that used to occur in the period of segregation. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, I think it's immoral and wrong, and gets our institutions involved. I think this this really repulsive activity of trying to measure people's races and skin colors. And so I hope even, even if socioeconomic class still leads to a kind of discretion that allows universities to kind of manage their student bodies, it will at least get us out of the business of skin color and races being the determinant. But back to the Fisher case. Justice Thomas also dissented, but he did not read it from the bench. Here's what he wrote. I write separately to reaffirm that a state's use of race in higher education admissions decisions is categorically prohibited by the Equal Protection Clause. The Constitution abhors classifications based on race because every time the government places citizens on racial registers and makes race relevant to the provision of burdens or benefits, it demeans us all. That constitutional imperative does not change in the face of a faddish theory that racial discrimination may produce educational benefits. The court was wrong to hold otherwise in Grutter. I would overrule Grutter and reverse the Fifth Circuit's judgment. Waiting in the wings was a challenge, perhaps the challenge, with the potential to shift the course of Supreme Court jurisprudence. A group of Asian American applicants who were denied admission to Harvard sued, alleging that the school imposes caps on the number of Asian Americans it will admit. They compare it to how Harvard limited the number of Jewish students in the 1930s and 40s. Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard. How can you guys seriously not find affirmative action unconstitutional now? And this case has been decades in the making, going all the way back to an investigation against Harvard in the 1980s. John Yu was a student at Harvard in the 1980s, and here's what he recalled. Back then, it wasn't widely known that this was going on. So of course, back then there was no internet. There was only three network channels. There were, you know, your local newspaper, my local is the Philadelphia Inquirer. They weren't running stories about discrimination against Asian Americans. 
and college education. There were no, uh, if there were lawsuits, it were in the news. So how would you know? So I had no idea. It was only actually when I got to Harvard that I saw, you know, there were, I actually worked on the student newspaper, the Harvard Crimson. And so we covered this story and I was like, no, that can't be true. But this guy sued. And I think he filed a, maybe also filed a complaint with the Department of Education. But these statistics, which showed that Asian American admission rates, not only were they lower than the normal rate, but they were f- almost fixed. They just fluctuated within a narrow, like half percent band year after year. More than 40 years later, not much has changed. Today, Harvard employs a holistic approach to admissions that includes giving applicants a personal rating. Harvard denies that race influences an applicant's personal rating, but the data reveals a clear racial hierarchy with Asian American applicants at the very bottom. I think Harvard thought no one would ever find out that they were running their admissions program this way. They had to create these lists <laughs> and measure people in these categories and that they, uh, that Harvard you know, would have a personality ranking on which Asians were the lowest rank, even though they hadn't even interviewed most of them, whereas Asians scored in the top quintile and all the other uh, qualities that they were looking for. I just think it's I just think it's outrageous. And looking at other aspects of the holistic review makes clear how much weight Harvard places on an applicant's race. Consider the following. For a competitive applicant, Harvard's rating system assigns an African-American applicant's skin color the same value as earning near-perfect SAT or ACT scores and grades, authoring original scholarship, or winning national-level awards. At trial, Harvard's own expert testified that race was the decisive factor for at least 45% of all admitted African-American and Hispanic applicants. Data shows African-American applicants in the fourth lowest academic decile have a higher chance of admission than Asian-American applicants in the top decile. And Harvard offers admission to Asian-American applicants at a lower rate than white applicants, even though Asian-Americans have higher academic scores, extracurricular scores, and alumni interview scores. Not to digress, but I just I just can't imagine anyone hearing that and be like, yeah, but that's cool. Yeah, like let's elevate the most arbitrary character that we all have, that we have no control over and that we're born into, to the most important factor. I mean, that just, who thinks that's a good idea? Okay, sorry, going back. Despite all this, Harvard denies that Asian American applicants are penalized because of their race. And the university says there is no workable alternative, even though Students for Fair Admissions has proposed several that would boost minority enrollment such as increasing socioeconomic preferences and eliminating legacy donor and faculty preferences. The district court agreed with Harvard. Here's what Judge Allison Burroughs wrote. Harvard's admissions process survives strict scrutiny. There is always the specter of perfection, but strict scrutiny does not require it. And a few identified imperfections do not alone require a finding that Harvard's admissions program is not narrowly tailored. It was always intended that affirmative action programs be limited in duration. As time marches on and the effects of entrenched racism and unequal opportunity remain obvious, the benefits that flow from the rich diversity at Harvard will foster the tolerance, acceptance, and understanding that will ultimately make race-conscious admissions obsolete. The appeals court agreed, and now Students for Fair Admissions has petitioned the Supreme Court for review. And this is probably a good time to mention that our colleagues at Pacific Legal Foundation filed a friend of the court brief urging the justices to hear the case. Here's a passage from the petition for certiorari, which I have to admit gave me chills when I read it. Our nation gave its word over and over again. It promised in every document of more than two centuries of history that all persons shall be treated equally. Our Constitution, as Justice Harlan recognized, is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The court vindicated the promise of equality in Brown versus Board of Education, rejecting any authority to use race as a factor in affording educational opportunities. Ten years later, Congress passed Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to extend Brown's command to private universities that accept federal funds. Yet Grutter v. Bollinger abandoned the principle of racial neutrality that Brown in Title VI vindicated. Grutter did so by improperly affording broad deference to university administrators to pursue a diversity interest that is far from compelling. To this end, Grutter endorsed racial objectives that are amorphous and unmeasurable, and thus incapable of narrow tailoring. Unsurprisingly, then, 
universities have used Grutter as a license to engage in outright racial balancing. This case shows that judicial scrutiny under Grutter is anything but strict. Harvard's treatment of Asian American applicants is appalling. Harvard penalizes them because, according to its admissions office, they lack leadership and confidence and are less likable and kind. This is reason enough to grant review. That Harvard engages in racial balancing and ignores race-neutral alternatives also proves that Harvard does not use race as a last resort. All of this makes intervention that much more urgent. Review thus would be warranted if the defendant were any university subject to Title VI. But this isn't just any university. It's Harvard. Harvard has been at the center of the controversy over ethnic and race-based admissions for nearly a century. The court should grant certiorari. When it's laid out this way, it seems hard to defend affirmative action. As John, you put it. You know, even if Harvard wins the lawsuit, they have really lost already, I think, in the court of public opinion. The ball is back in the justices' court. And we likely won't know until later this year whether the court will grant review. Perhaps the changing demographics of our country will affect whether racial preferences in college admissions continue to pass constitutional scrutiny. As Roger Clegg said, I think that with every tick of the clock, we're coming closer to the, the, you know, the 25-year expiration date that, uh, that Justice uh, O'Connor set on this nonsense in, uh, in her Grutter decision. And I think that just, you know, with the march of time, Americans become, and, and as the, you know, the demographics of the country change, it, it becomes harder and harder to believe that it makes sense for our public institutions to be looking at the race and ethnicity of, uh, of Americans and, and deciding to treat some better and, and others worse. On the, on the basis of which, you know, silly little box they, they check. It's, it's a much more diverse country, you know, now than it was, you know, 50 years ago. It's Asian Americans now who are being discriminated against as well. Um, it's Latinos, you know, who are being given, you know, uh, preferential treatment. That's much more, much more difficult case to make in, in terms of, you know, historical redress. We may find out soon whether the Supreme Court is ready to return to a vision of the Constitution as colorblind. Thanks for listening to DIST. And thanks to our friends at the Heritage Foundation. I recorded the interviews with Roger Clegg and John Yu while working there. A special shout out to Jason Sneed and Jessica Klein, who worked with me on those interviews. Please subscribe to DIST wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd appreciate your feedback. So send questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes to dist at pacificlegal.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends to check out DIST. Who? Okay, let's jump in. I don't have a title for this episode. Hmm. Something about that 25 years or something. Yeah, the clock is a ticking. I wasn't... I... Past its expiration date. Ooh. Like some two-year-old goldfish. <laughs> read these cases and you don't cry yourself to sleep at night, uh, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you know, you read Justice Kennedy's opinion, you know, in Fisher too, and, and uh, certainly should bring a tear to your eye, you know, the, you know what, what, what happened there. Doesn't even make sense. Shadow okay. talking. <laughs> don't record this. This is not going in the bloopers. <laughs> uh... So as you mentioned, you, you went on to college. Uh, you went to Harvard, graduating in 1989, graduating summa cum laude, and that's that's not good enough for your mom? That's the only thing that means anything these days is graduating summa. Y'all ready for this? Do, 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 do. I had a banana. Okay. <laughs> She's high on sugar. I really am. Critical, critical mass. mass. Critical mass, of course. A critical mass, yeah. which usually only occurs when there's a nuclear reaction <laughs> leading to an explosion <laughs> of some kind. Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin. The sequel. You like that? I joined you. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, Check your personality for the bonus episodes, okay? <laughs> All right. Sorry. 
It was too tempting. And I'm, 